here. Um, I wish we were all in person, but I'm super glad we get to have this conversation anyway. Um, I'd really encourage you. I like I like presentations to be really interactive. If it, if it's not interactive, I could have just recorded it and, and emailed it to you. Um, so let's let's do what we can to make this interactive. If you have a comment or a question or a story to share, uh, feel free to drop it in chat or to ask a question in the Q and A. Um, or if if you want to speak it, um, like like Marley said, just uh, hit your raise your hand and she can unmute you. Um, I'm not super good at talking and reading at the same time. So if I don't see your question or it looks like I didn't see it, I feel free to raise your hand and talk. Um, you might have noticed that the title of this presentation was seven lessons and I don't have a number seven on the slide. I think there's actually eight lessons in here. There's probably a lot more, um, but what I would challenge you all is to think about what lessons you've learned as well. Um, and then at some point during this talk or right afterwards, um, go and tweet um, some lesson that you've learned about working with open source software, um, tweet it to your followers. You can tag me, I'm at storming, um, or you can drop it in chat here. Um, but I'd love to have everybody in the audience think about a lesson or two that they've learned working with open source software um, and share it with us as well, because I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, Microsoft doesn't have all the answers. We're all here together to figure that out. Um, so I thought I would uh, start with a brief introduction of, of who I am. Um, I've actually spent the last 20 years working with open source software. Um, I was at Hewlett Packard when I wanted to port um, GNOME to HPOX. I actually realized that all of these companies had teams of people working on open source, uh, working on CDE, the user interface for HPOX. And we were not only developing the same functionality because we all went to standards groups and decided what it would look like. And then we'd all go back and write code to do that. But we even had like identical lists of bugs that we were going to fix. And I just thought that was like crazy um, that I had a team of people solving the exact same problems that Sun did, that IBM did. And I thought there's got to be a better way. Um, luckily for, for me and for us, um, open source was around. Linux was just starting to become popular. It's about the year 2000. Um, and I thought we could, Linux has not just one, but two desktops. Um, we could take one of those and, and use it and work on it and contribute to it. And it turned out not to be a technical problem. It turned out to be a business problem. I got to learn a lot about open source software. I got to learn a lot about licenses. I went and took a copy, copyright class. Um, and, it, and I ended up creating one of the very first open source programs offices at HP. Um, since then, I spent most of my career trying to help different groups understand each other. So helping business um, leaders understand development, developers understand business reasons, helping open source software communities understand companies and companies understand open source software communities. Why do they do it for free? Um, so I've kind of played a bridge and I've gone through nonprofits and companies and startups and large companies. Um, and now I'm at Microsoft where I lead the open source programs office. Microsoft has been through quite the open source journey. Um, they did a lot of it all of it before I got here. Um, but I wanted to share with you um, what they've done because I think it's relevant um, to many companies and to many people looking to advance open source software. And at any time, you are welcome to drop your own question or comment in the chat. So all of you are here, you probably know that open source software is here to stay, but I was looking at some of these numbers and they're, they're really crazy. They're crazy numbers. Um, there's 55 million developers working uh, just on open source software that's located on GitHub. That's 55 million people worldwide. And what's even crazier about that is 10 million of those people joined within the last year. So we've grown at like 25% just over the last year in the number of individuals contributing to open source software. And another stat that I think is, is really awesome, and maybe all of you are around the globe. I don't, I can't pull the audience and see where you're from. Um, but 80% of those contributors are not in the United States. So this is a very global community. And the stat I find even more amazing is if you take the average repo on GitHub, um, they have an average of 41 countries represented among the contributors. Um, so really, really impressive numbers on like open source software isn't just here to stay. It's actually like, it, it is a thing. Um, and then I wanted to point out, this is a study that came out just a month or two ago from McKinsey and Company um, that showed that, that companies that use open source software are 30% more innovative. And I think even more important, um, and there's been a number of studies have pointed at this, um, developers at companies that get to use open source software are much more satisfied and they stay longer. Um, and, and that's because they're getting to use the tools that they, they want to use. It's more efficient, kind of like my first job where I was like, wow, I can't believe we're fixing bugs that other people are fixing the same bugs. You know, open source kind of 
helps us all work together and build on the work of others. Um, we even see this at interns at Microsoft. So the interns come and want to work on open source software and they're excited um, that that's one of the rewards um, of an internship at Microsoft is when they get to work on open source software. Um, so so I, I like to say, and I, um, so I wanted to point out, in case you had any doubts, that Microsoft is experienced with open source software, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we have 30,000 employees, the slide says 27,000, but we're just about 30,000. 30,000 employees who have linked their Microsoft identity to their GitHub identity. So this is a, might always be a developer, might be a developer, a product manager, might even be an executive, has taken their Microsoft identity and said, yes, I am that person on GitHub. And it's a voluntary um, association that they don't have to do. Um, and of those 30,000 employees, they've created 10,000 repos um, in Microsoft organizations on GitHub. And if you look at the top 10 projects on GitHub by number of contributors, um, you can see the top couple are Microsoft projects. Um, in particular, our developer tools team is very active in open source um, with projects like VS Code and .NET and TypeScript. Um, we also have a really strong documentation community. Our accessibility tools are out there. Um, so we've really discovered that open source software is a, a great way to work. And it's a great way to work with our customers. I'm trying. And it's been quite the journey. So the story that I like to share, and I, I just have um, the slide and then I'm actually get into how we do it at Microsoft. Um, but the story that I like to share is that I think the very first contribution that Microsoft made to open source software was to be the common enemy. Um, so I was actually at the GNOME Foundation around 2005, 2006, and we saw Microsoft Windows as the biggest competition, as the enemy. And we partnered with our open source competition. Um, so we partnered with KDE um, in order to try to beat Microsoft Windows. So that was Microsoft's very first contribution. Um, they've come a long way since. Um, we've open sourced many things. Um, we've adopted both open source usage internally as well as open sourcing things. Um, Microsoft is one of the, the largest contributors to the Linux kernel, which often surprises things. And um, if you watch the news, we've been open sourcing projects um, regularly. I think one of the most recent ones was a fluid framework out of the, the Windows Office team. Um, so we're, we're always constantly working with it. Um, and I think that's that's been a it's been a long journey both inside Microsoft to convince people and outside Microsoft to convince them that we're really genuine about collaborating. So at, how do we do that at Microsoft and, and what lessons might we have learned that might be useful to somebody else? Um, so I run the open source programs office and our job at Microsoft is to make sure that all the other teams at Microsoft can use open source software effectively and safely and securely and as easily as possible. Um, so we actually have uh, over 5 million usages of open source software components in Microsoft. Um, so this is a, you know, component can be small and it might be reused by multiple teams, but we are tracking over 5 million instances of, my, of open source software just used at Microsoft, not to mention those 10,000 repos that we've open sourced. And in order to do this, I thought I removed all the build across of, out of the slide. Um, we partner across the organization. So I actually get, um, I talk to a lot of Microsoft customers about open source and a lot of them are interested in creating an open source programs office, even ones that aren't in the software industry. So I talk to um, banks and you know retail department stores that you might've got into um, and they're all interested in creating an open source programs office. And one of the first questions that they ask me is where should it live? Like, should it be in legal? Should it be in engineering? Should it be in the office of the CTO? And, and my answer is it has to involve all those people. It doesn't really matter where it lives as long as you work with all those people. Um, so at Microsoft, our open source programs office team is pretty small. Um, we're about six, seven people, um, but we work very closely with legal. So we have a, a legal team that just focuses on open source software. And they were really instrumental in the beginning in helping us with that culture change. Um, they also now help us set the policies, um, review licenses, talk to teams that have questions. So legal is key. HR is key because um, we actually measure employees at Microsoft. You know, when you do, it's not an annual evaluation, it's a quarterly evaluation, I think. Um, there's three questions on there and all three are super relevant to open source software. Um, but one is like, did they build on the work of others? Like instead of not inventing it all themselves, did they take the work of others and did they build on it? And did they help others um, succeed? And I think open source software, like that, 
that's key to that in engineering. Um, did you take existing solutions and build on them? And did you help your colleagues um, with the problems that, that you saw there that you could help with? And um, we also work really closely with the security and accessibility teams. Um, the security team focuses a lot on helping make sure that the open source supply chain is secure. Um, we recently joined the Open SSF group um, out of the Linux Foundation. A lot of work happens there. Um, accessibility is an area where I think we have a lot to contribute. Um, and we've open sourced our accessibility tools and they're available to all open source software projects. And then we created a couple of groups across Microsoft um, just to help spread best practices um, across. So each, each business unit at Microsoft decides for themselves what their strategy is and how open source software is a part of that. So like the developer tools team that has open sourced you know, VS Code and .NET and TypeScript, they've adopted like develop in the open, work closely with our customers who are developers, our users, um, and many of their things are just open source kind of by default. Um, teams like Microsoft um, Office and Windows are dealing with large proprietary products, you know, they already have, and they're figuring out how open source software can be a part of that. Um, they use open source software, but they also open source parts that make sense um, that they can open source. And so things like Fluid Framework just came out of that. So the point of my story um, is that the, the open source exec council that we have is a group of executives from across those businesses. And they come together once a quarter and discuss how they're using open source software in their strategies, um, what's working, what's not working, um, any escalations they've had, any like ahas or best practices, and they share those with each other. Um, we also have a group, well, we also work externally with a lot of our industry peers, um, a lot of Linux Foundation groups, the To Do group, um, a lot of foundations like the Apache Foundation. Um, but I wanna talk about one of their internal group too, is that we have a group called Open Source Champs. Um, who are more at the developer level. They're also from across Microsoft. Um, they get together more often. We have like a coffee chat every month. We have like a Teams chat room where we chat all the time um, and they share best practices and they're kind of like a first line of, of expertise um, for their businesses. Um, so if someone in their business says, I'm thinking about open sourcing this, how am I gonna set it up so I can grow a community? Um, they would be there to, to help answer those types of questions. And so we work closely with engineers. Oh, the other group that I didn't mention is that we have an open source software engineering group. Um, and this is a group, um, we have a, a team that helps build, build um, tools for all of Microsoft. And within that team, they have an open source team that helps build tools just for open source software. And in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we do there. Um, so if, if you are, if you are at Microsoft, um, well, you're gonna to have to take a screenshot of that. I don't know why it's not staying there. Um, I'll go back. So if you were at um, Microsoft and you're a developer and you download open source software, which you're allowed to do and check it out and you put it into your build environment and you build that open source software into your tools, um, we have tools that will automatically detect that when you do a build. And it'll figure out that you're using open source software. It will figure out what license you're using um, it'll figure out whether or not that license is just okay to use, which is the majority of the cases, or it might say, you know, there's some risk here. I think you really need a, it'll kick off a legal review or a business review and make sure that you get what you need. Um, then it'll say, oh, you need a notice file for this if you do, and it'll create one for you. Um, if you need to host the source code somewhere before you ship the product, there's a place for that. Um, so there's just a, a lot of tools um, that work in the background to help make sure developers are, are doing the right thing and making the right choices. And that's really key because when someone's using open source software, you want to make life really easy for them. You don't want to tell the developer, oh, if you want to use that library, um, you're going to go have to fill out a form and request to use it and wait two weeks and, you know, then maybe you can use it. At that point, they've picked another tool, they've moved on, um, they're not interested in it anymore. So our tooling is really to help them be able to just download that library and start using it We'll kick off reviews if needed. We'll figure out the licenses, um, but let them keep doing their job and keep building awesome software. So once again, quick look at that process and what it looks like in a visual. Oh, that time it's gonna stay. Um, and then what we've done is, is try to share many of these tools um, with the world. Um, and so, what, and I see we have a question. Has Microsoft thought about open sourcing their open source detection? I'm just about to talk about that. But yes, we have um, some parts are easy to open source and some aren't. Um, so it's actually multiple tools that work together. Um, so on the Microsoft 
open source portal repo on GitHub. Um, there's actually a lot of um, projects that we use, not so much to detect open source, but projects that we use to help Microsoft employees um, on GitHub. And we have just little tools like, um, you can see here it says Stormy Peters FTE. So when I'm roaming around GitHub, um, I can actually see who is a Microsoft employee or who has elected to identify their Microsoft identity with their GitHub identity. Um, that's often useful, especially if there's like a, if there was like a code of conduct violation and I got a notice of it on a Microsoft project, I could easily go to the project and see who's a Microsoft employee who could maybe help me out um, and answer that. Um, so it's often useful. So there's a bunch of tools there everything from like detecting that there's no admins on this repo that we're, we're supposed to be maintaining or that there's 200 admins, which is kind of a security issue. Um, so we have a bunch of tools there. Um, on the detection side, we've actually created um, a couple of larger projects um, that we're collaborating with others. So clearly defined is the project um, where we figure out what license a package is under. Um, so one of the problems that we had was that um, we would discover the open source software and then when we would go to figure out what license it had, like the license field might be blank um, or the license field might say something that made no sense. Like maybe it was a typo instead of MIT, they put MTI um, and the tools can't really figure that out very well. Um, or maybe it would say, um, it would say um, we have a, sorry, I was reading and talking at the same time. And like I said, I'm not very good at that. Um, it might say hey, it's an MIT license, but then when we actually look through the source code, through the files, um, it would be a GPL file in there. And so the, the license information was really inconsistent and not very helpful. Um, so we created this project called Clearly Defined. Um, we now have a number of companies that are working on it with us. It's you know Microsoft, GitHub, and the United Nations Foundation, and the Eclipse Foundation, and Bloomberg, and others um, are either using the data or contributing. And it's an API that you can query and figure out what license um, your project is under. So we, if you're at a company that cares about licensing for large numbers of projects, I think it's not quite as useful if you're an individual that's just using one or two projects, but if you're using a lot of them and you need to verify licenses, super useful. Um, we have meetings every other Monday um, and then there's Discord and other ways to get involved. It's on GitHub. So please come join us. And the other one that we created was after, um, and I, and I got Derek's question. So I, I, if I didn't get, answer your question or if I haven't answered by the end of the slide, Derek, uh, feel free to jump back in there. Um, the other project that we that we created um, is we had customers that would come to us. Um, in particular, it seemed to be a lot of German customers. Um, and they would say, you're giving us software and we're deploying that software. And we know it has open source software in it. And we really need to know that you did the right thing. And we need to know that we're doing the right thing. So could you please tell us all the open source software you're using and all the ways that all the licenses in there and all the ways that you verified that it's right. We have 5 million components deployed across Microsoft products. Um, we wanted to make sure that when we answered that question, we answered it in a helpful way. So we didn't want to give them like a stack of papers that was like 10 feet high and say, you know, here's all the software, here's all the licenses have at it. Um, so we actually worked with the Linux Foundation. This, this was our legal group at Microsoft. Um, worked with the Linux Foundation and started a, a, a standard, so like an ISO standard, like you think of like software standard, um, to describe what it means to be open source compliant. Um, and they call it open chain. And it describes like what types of roles your company should have, what the responsibilities are. Um, it describes what kind of training you should have, um, what kind of documentation you should have around open source, what kind of processes, and then you can certify yourself as open chain compliant. And then you know that any company that's open chain compliant has a good compliance process for dealing with open source software. It may not always be perfect, um, but it's a good process and they have a process for like, if they make a mistake, how they're gonna deal with it. Um, so I think that's a, a really good best practice and a way for companies to establish trust in the supply chain across companies. And just as a reminder, like if you have a question or you have an example or you have something to share, um, feel free to drop it in chat, feel free to drop it in the Q&A or raise your hand and you can speak it. Um, the moderator will unmute you. Um, and remember, you're supposed to be thinking of one lesson either that I'm presenting that was new to you or that you thought of during this presentation um, and go ahead and tweet it. And you can share it in chat with us too.
Um, so one of the things that that we found that was that was super useful um, when we had developers working um, with open source software is how close it brought our developers um, to the users. So at a, at a company like Microsoft, you know, we have 50,000 developers who are writing software and they don't, they don't all normally talk to the customer directly. Um, this is the number of paths that information gets from the customer to the developer. Um, for example, the, the sales team gets requirements and requests directly from the customer. Um, those trickle back into the developer, probably through product marketing. Product marketing often gets to go out to the customer and ask questions about how they're using it. Um, and what the, they found and what they like and what they don't like. Um, and they're very good at coming back to the developers and, and presenting that and sharing that customer information. But again, it's secondhand. Um, the support team definitely works very closely with the customers. And I don't have a slide on that, but the how we do support in the open source software world is, is actually really interesting because um, a lot of developers end up coming to the GitHub repo for support instead of through our normal support channels and how we deal with that and how the support team deals with that is, is quite interesting. Um, but in the open source software world, the developer, instead of getting all of their information from the customer through those three or four different channels, they are actually, the customer can come find them in GitHub and ask them a question. Um, and that's really good. Um, it's, it's rewarding to our developers. Um, they're more likely to stay and work on the project when they get to see and hear how people are using it. And it means the feedback from the customer is not filtered through anybody else's lens or ears um, before it hits the developer. It also means the customer could suggest a change in a pull request um, or actually help vet ideas as they come out so that we quickly um, know whether an idea is gonna work for them or not before we spend a lot of time developing it, packaging it, shipping it. So the connecting developers to users has been really, really key. Um, a key way that open source software has helped us across our development life cycle. Um, so we have a, a question from an attendee that says, in our organization, we have a process called third party approvals, which is a manual process. We have to go to a tool and create the approval process. And there's a legal team that looks at each third party tool or library and approves it. It takes a great amount of time creating one by the developer and takes two weeks for the approval team to approve. How can the tools that you explain help reduce this time? Yeah, so when we detect open source software and we detect the license, um, a large number of them we have decided do not need approval. Um, and our, our tooling helps us feel confident that we really know what license the, the project is under. Um, so if, if, um, if the license is under like an MIT license, we just say, okay, you're, you're free to use that software. You know, and it doesn't, we also have a list of like software that's flagged for different reasons. If it's not flagged for any reason and it's under MIT license, you can just go ahead and use it. Um, if we found out it was a GPL license, we would ask you a few more questions. The tool would ask you a few more questions. So it would ask you, um, are you planning to ship this? How are you building it? You know, we have a few questions to determine whether or not um, the copyleft clause is invoked or not. Um, and if it wasn't clear or if it was the copyleft license was invoked, then we would kick off a legal review and a business review because we would want the legal team to actually look at it and we would want um, the business lead for that, that group to, to verify that that's really what they want to do. Um, or if it was a license, if we didn't know the license, um, first of all, we would open up an issue, the tool would open up an issue to, or the developer themselves could do it, um, to go investigate what the license is, um, but we would also kick off a legal review so that somebody from the legal team could help figure out what the license is. So I don't, I don't remember the percentage off the top of my head, but it's, it's over 80%, probably close to 90% of usage just gets approved by the tool, and the developer doesn't even see that like it, it's just part of the build environment one of the tabs that has information about open source software they could go look at it if they wanted to um, so by taking that number down to a much smaller number it's it's much faster for most use cases um, then the tooling itself actually clicks off it, we might ask them questions but they don't have to go to a tool um, to request to use it when they use it it says hey you need to ask permission if they do um, and it kicks off those reviews so i, I think that answers your question of how for us tooling is, is making it much faster. Now there is a manual process. So if you want to explore it, something before you actually download it and build it, or you want to open source something, you can go to the approval process tool and, and fill out an approval process. I'm sorry, I'm not using the right words here. You can fill out a ticket and, and it, it get, an issue and it gets sent off. 
The, the other thing um, that we've found is really helpful when building open source software into our strategies, um, and I talked about this, I alluded to this earlier, is, is giving a lot of autonomy. So we give autonomy to the developers. Um, they can decide what open source software they want to try out and explore, um, and they're free to download it. Um, I'll talk about our open source software policies completely documented and online for anyone to see. So if they have a question about, is it okay for me to do this? Um, they can go read, the, the policy and see if it's not clear there. We work really hard to make it clear, but if it's not, they can ask the open source champs um, or they can drop us a, an email or in chat or an email. We also give autonomy to the different business units, which I also talked about. Um, so the Windows Office team can, can figure out what makes sense for them. The Xbox team can figure out what how open source software fits into their world and what makes sense to them because the gaming industry is probably very different than the Office Productivity team. Um, the Developer Tools team develops their own strategy and policy. Um, so each, each business unit has autonomy to decide how open source software fits into their strategy. And each developer has autonomy to decide which open source software is useful to them as they develop the software, as they do their jobs. So I said, we, we have an open source software policy at Microsoft. Um, our goal is to make it really easy to understand and available to everybody. Um, I'm not showing you our internal documentation, but we have summarized and shared uh, much of our policy on our website. So if you go to opensource.microsoft.com and you go under our program, um, you can see an overview of some of the tools we're using. And then on the top right there, you see using open source, contributing, releasing projects. And um, we actually talk about what our policies are um, what the review processes look like if we're going to use open source software, contribute to it, um, or, or release our own software as open source. Cool. If anyone has questions, feel free to, to jump in or things that you want to you wanna share. Um, another thing that, that we've done is make sure that we're learning from others and sharing what we learn. So, talks like this, um, I'm hoping it's 2A, so I shared a bunch of stuff and hopefully you also share um, best practices or things we might not have thought of. Um, one of the places where we share a lot of open source programs office type of information like review process and compliance um, is at the to-do group. To-do group is a group of Linux Foundation member companies um, that all of these, most everyone in the to-do group actually runs an open source programs office um, and the companies they represent are across the board. There's software companies, um, there's banks, there's um, media companies, there's all sorts of companies that get together and we share what we do in our companies, what questions we have, what things we've seen in the industry. Um, we actually write white papers um, and share those. So there's a lot of information there and a lot of com camaraderie. Um, and in a normal year, we also meet in person a lot at events like All Things Open. Um, several of those people are actually speaking at other talks during this, this conference. Um, they also share best practices. So FOSS Fund is one um, that Dwayne O'Brien from Indeed, he runs Indeed's open source programs office. Um, he came up with the idea called FOSS Fund. I'm just giving that as an example because there's many others. Um, but he came up with um, an idea that a company could earmark or dedicate uh, $120,000 a year. And then every month we, Microsoft for example, gives $10,000 to an open source software project. And the, the key is um, to identify which project is gonna get the money. We ask our developers who are contributing to open source software to nominate and vote on the projects. So the $10,000 goes to some project that Microsoft employees have said, this project is important. Like I work in open source software and this project is important to Microsoft, is important to me and could really use $10,000 to send developers to conferences or um, to buy a, a new, computer system or to hire a part-time sysadmin, whatever, whatever it is they would like to do. Um, so ideas like that also come out of that group. Um, and then um, there's a lot of foundations that we're part of, you probably heard of a lot of them, but uh, foundations are a great way, a great way to do a number of things. Um, so foundations allow us to meet and talk to other people that contribute to the project, um, which is really important. Um, and they often have annual events, you know, ApacheCon is where the Apache group gets together. Um, Linux has several events. Um, there are ways for us to meet and talk to people. There are also um, ways to clarify how, how the governance and working together of those projects happen. Um, it's a way for us to financially support the projects. Um, it's, often, it's easy to 
not easy, but it's easier to sign up for a subscription and say, you know, this is membership um, for the Linux Foundation than it would be to like go around and, and hold out our hands and ask for $5,000 for this and $1,000 for this. It's easier to like join a membership. And it's a way for companies to very clearly clarify how they, they work together. And it's a way to support efforts like marketing efforts or events or things that might not um, be easily done within the, the project's technical infrastructure. Um, so foundations are really important and one of the ways that, that we um, contribute back and get to participate. So there's a question from the audience on how do you make sure that competitive secret IP is not accidentally open sourced or that your patents are not granted via open source licenses that include a patent grant? Um, so we do, if we open source something, we do do a lot of review on it. Um, some things that we have been asked to open source um, Microsoft Money, for example, everyone would like us to open source Microsoft Money. Um, they're often were developed with other companies' IP, or in part, I don't know about Microsoft Money in particular, but they have other companies' IP, or we develop them in partnership, um, and we can't, it's, it just would take a ton of time to go back and verify that all the intellectual property was okay for us to open source. Um, and especially in something that we don't know if there'll be a community, it's not a product we ship anymore. Um, so sometimes we always do a lot of research. And so that's part of the decision on whether or not we open source something. Um, so like when we open source Fluid Framework, we did a lot of, you know, we analyzed all the code and made sure that it was all ours and that we could license it under the license we picked. Um, on the patent side, um, same thing would happen. There'd be a review, um, but, but Microsoft is actually part of the, the open OIN, Open Innovation Network. Um, we have patent agreements um, that support Linux and open source software. So I encourage you to go out and look at that. Um, Microsoft is one of the, the supporting members of that. Um, and in a way it makes parts of our patent portfolio available to support open source software in Linux. And then I just have a, a last um, lesson to share. Hopefully you saw seven lessons there. Maybe you saw eight, maybe you saw more. Um, I'm gonna ask you about that. Um, but one of, one of the things that I think we found is really important, and I alluded to it when I said we worked with HR, um, but that's making sure that we are rewarding our employees for working on open source software, especially when you're at a company that doesn't traditionally have a lot of open source software contribution culture. It's important to make sure that you're doing things that make your culture more open source friendly. Um, so during the evals that we do, we ask, have you built on the work of others? Have you contributed to others' work? That's very open source friendly. Um, open source is officially um, recognized and documented in the developer skill set. And there's training available to all developers on how to use GitHub or how to build open source software communities. Um, we've also built the open source champs to help answer those questions. Um, we try, we're doing a lot of work to try to make sure that we are rewarding um, people using open source software in their in their day to day work um, and in their strategies. And I think if you don't do this piece, um, no matter how good you say it is, um, people are going to continue doing what they're what they're motivated to do, um, what they get rewarded for to do, um, what their managers say great job for, um, what they get a bonus for. Um, so we're trying to make sure very consciously make sure that we're reward, rewarding open source software because it's good for both our employees and for the community and for our customers. Um, I didn't share at the beginning that Microsoft's mission is to enable individuals and organizations to achieve more. And I think open source software fits so well in that. Um, so the open source programs office mission is to enable individuals and organizations to achieve more through open source software, because that is definitely a tool um, that can be easily used to help people achieve more in the world. And we're all building on the work of others. So that is what I had for, for presentation and for lessons learned at Microsoft that I wanted to share with you. I am curious, um, for those of you in the audience, what lesson have you, what did you get out of this presentation or what lesson have you learned um, in your company or in your work in open source or what questions do you have for me? So we have 10 minutes for q and I'm not gonna keep talking for 10 more minutes. So. One of you has to ask a question or share something. I would normally pick on somebody, but it's, it's a little hard um, this way. <laughs> 
Well, if there's no questions, um, that is my Twitter ID there, Storming. So you can go to twitter.com slash storming. Um, you're welcome to ask me questions there. Um, you're welcome to share with me um, anything that you've learned. Um, if you wanna talk now, you can just raise your hand and we'll turn on your microphone. So if people wanna chat, um, we can do that. And I will stay here if anyone wants to talk. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Aaron. All right, we got one Q and A in the Q and A tool. So the question is, what's one thing you want to change about Microsoft's open source program for next year? Um, so what I found it since I've been at Microsoft is, is Microsoft has a really strong culture of code ownership. Um, so when someone at Microsoft um, writes a tool just, just for internal use and other teams start using it, they support that tool for them. So there could be like 20 teams across Microsoft that use this really useful tool. And that person, um, the part time of their job will take it on themselves to support it. And the other teams, if they find a problem, will look, like if I wrote it, will look to me to fix it. And they won't um, fix it themselves because that would be stepping on my toes. Like, why would you mess with my code? Um, so I would love to, to continue to explore how we change that in the inner source model and the open source model, that helping others build better things um, doesn't infringe on ownership and responsibility. Because the ownership thing is really awesome from like, I feel responsible for my code and I maintain it. So how can we expand that? So for the next year, that's what I'm focused on. The next question is, so thanks for the question. Um, the next question is, what is the chance that Windows will have a Linux kernel? Um, I could not speak to that. Like I said, all of the business um, units at Microsoft make their own open source strategies. I, I haven't heard that, but um, you'd have to ask somebody from the Windows group. Cool, any other questions or comments? So Heather says she's thankful to think about how to build open source and humanitarian action by learning what OSPOs do. That and, and the other humanitarian cause that I think is really interesting, um, if you haven't heard of it, and we should go research um, HFOS, Humanitarian Free and Open Source Software. And I first met them, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago at Grace Hopper. And they were there talking about the secret that they had discovered. Um, these two professors had decided that they wanted to encourage more students to join their computer science department. And so over the summer, they invited students at their university to come work on humanitarian open source software projects. Um, for example, they worked on Sahana, which is like the disaster recovery software helps you track um, what you do in, an, in a disaster recovery situation. And they were really surprised. Their first day of class, like half the class was women, which just really doesn't happen in like entry computer science classes very often anymore. Um, so they discovered that they were more likely to attract women to computer science classes if the cause was a humanitarian cause um, than if it was just a make something run faster cause. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a movement to try to see how we can incorporate that to, to improve diversity across projects. Any other questions or, or comments anyone has? I can see a whole bunch of you still hanging out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang out. So if you wanna chat, oh, I do got a question. Um, how does Microsoft think about foundation sponsorships and memberships given how large the organization is? Um, so if, if the foundation sponsorship or membership is, is really particular to one group, um, that group decides and joins. So if it, if it was like, um, you know, gaming, I'm not a gamer, but if it was something very spe specific to like the Xbox uh, world and it was a gaming project or foundation, they, they would decide and they would come up with it from their budget. Um, some of them obviously span many groups across Microsoft. Um, for example, like the Linux Foundation membership has so many different subgroups and so many projects part of it. Um, that we decide that at the open source programs office level um, and we pull money from the different groups for that. And what we do is we actually have a open decision framework. Ah, I'm gonna, you wouldn't know the word, but we, we have like a document um, where we have whoever decided it was a good idea to join the foundation. Like they're like, you know, I think this one's important and we should be supporting it. They fill out this document and they say, 
what the name of the foundation is, you know, all the info about it, um, what membership looks like, who in Microsoft will help make sure that we participate in, in a good fashion. Like it's not just about money, it's about you know, attending the meetings and contributing and being a good foundation member. Um, so they'll fill all that out. And then we send it around to the executives and to other people. Um, so everybody has a chance to, to take a look at it and say, awesome, or have you thought about this? Um, and then we'll, we'll fund it centrally. It was an anonymous attendee that submitted the question, but if, if it didn't answer your question, feel free to type another one. Any other questions or comments or things you learned? I'm not trying to follow Twitter because like that would be too much to talk and read and follow Twitter, but hopefully you're sharing things you learned there as well. What's the most important thing you learned about open source software when dealing with companies or interested companies? You can just drop it in chat. So we have a question. Um, if you have a product manager who's suspicious regarding open source, what is your best argument to convince her or him? Um, I, I think the key to talking to people who are skeptical about open source software is, is obviously, and you've probably thought of this, to figure out um, what, why, like what, what are they suspicious of? Um, for example, I worked in a previous job, um, I worked with a salesperson who was just really baffled about why people would work in their free time on software. And I eventually told him I thought he was missing two pieces. Um, one, he was missing how much fun it is to write software. So I, I, I tried to make analogies to writing software to hobbies that he might have, you know, how it's about solving problems and, you know, making puzzles or creating arts. You know, part of it is just like, it's, it's a fun way to solve a problem. And then I talked about the problems that they were solving, like why they were willing to give up their free time. You know, people volunteer for all sorts of causes like building houses or, um, helping out in nursing homes. And so I tried to equate like the problems they were solving, that's how they volunteered their time. In his particular case, it wasn't about like why open source, it was like, why do people do this for free? Um, so I think that the key is, is getting to know them well enough to understand like what it is they're skeptical of or what it is that they're afraid of. Anybody else have, have any suggestions or, or ways that they would deal with a, a suspicious product manager or product manager suspicious of open source? So one of the comments says, and you guys can probably read this, or you all can probably read this. Um, often people who don't understand open source are very concerned about security. If you can see all the code, how can it be secure? And I, I actually think there's a lot of good work that you, if that's the case, you could point them at now. Um, like a lot of people working on the secure supply chain and authenticating where it came from and you know, being able to verify that it is what they created. Um, there's even work on, on helping understand who worked on a project. There's a lot of good work there. Any other suggestions for, for Holger or for any other questions or any other things you learned? I see Heather, Heather said she learned to, has learned um, to be tenacious and do your homework. So I do think we're actually at time now. Um, you know how to find me if you wanna to come chat or you wanna ask a question or you wanna share anything. Um, it was great to talk to you all and I hope you have an awesome rest of all things open.